uh, do this pri prioritization uh, uh, exercise in the real world where we have social, economic and political situations that we have to uh, take into account. And even if we don't want to take into account uh, these situations, especially the economic and political situations, they will, <laughs> they will influence our, uh, our prioritization exercises and analysis. So um, we may have an optimal solution that uh, protects all biotic diversity in a particular region, uh, uh, maybe a high endemism region. Uh, and we may have uh, taken into account also the persistence of those populations, but in the end, we have to adapt our solution, we have to modify our solution to meet the reality, the uh, social, economic and political reality. So we can, we can only do the best we can given the uh, uh, real context that we are uh, acting um, on. Uh, and then ideally these solutions that we, that we generate uh, through these uh, prior place prioritization exercises um, should should be um, designed as an ad, uh, similar to an adaptive management plan. Is anyone familiar with this idea of adaptive management? One. Do you want to tell us, or sh I should not put you on the spot with adaptive management? And that means I have to migrate over there, find my way somehow. Migration is good. Migration is good. Dispersal. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, trial and error mm -hmm. uh, because uh, everything's going uh, changing and uh, there is a dynamics. So when the problems arise, our system, management system and approach should uh, fit to the, the, the existing circumstance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So yes. So we need to be, yeah. we need to be uh, constantly analyzing, uh, monitoring our, um, our actions and then uh, uh, modify, adapt the initial plan that we had. So I'm going to go back to front. Um, so that's the adaptive management that comes from uh, wildlife management. It's, uh, it's a very important concept in wildlife management. And we can think of, we can make a parallel between adaptive management and this idea here. We implement a solution, but then we should evaluate and we should be flexible about replacing, adding, slightly modifying or uh, majorly modifying, if necessary, our place prioritization uh, exercise. Of course, this is not, it's easy to say we should be doing this. We should be uh, implementing uh, a place prioritization uh, plan, uh, evaluate and then modify, uh, adjust such that it meets uh, our conservation goals. But again, a lot of times it's hard to actually do this, um, um, replace uh, protected areas and revise the protected areas because we have, again, limited resources. Uh, we are acting in a, a real world with political and economic uh, pressures. But ideally, we should be trying to evaluate in other words, not have just a static view of the uh, place prioritization process. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. So how do, identify, how do we identify these, uh, these candidate uh, protected areas or reserves or areas to set aside uh, for conservation uh, uh, purposes? First step, an important step, is to review what we have. So first of all, if um, the conservation goal is to maybe uh, limit the threat to an endemic species and um, make sure that the genetic diversity of, the, of those populations is maintained via, let's say, dispersal, first thing we have to do is evaluate what we have in terms of existing protected areas and see if the existing network, network of protected areas meets the goal uh, of uh, of our conservation um, target. So, in other words, because going back, because the protected areas um, historically have not been established with conservation in mind or with uh, biodiversity uh, conservation in mind, uh, 
by luck or chance alone, we may have an, uh, an optimal uh, placement of protect protected areas for some conservation goals. So we minimize uh, costs by first reviewing what we have so far in place in terms of protected areas. But usually and generally after this initial step, we do find that we need additional protected areas to uh, be successful uh, in, uh, with our conservation goals, to meet our conservation goals. Now, to select these additional protected areas, there are three uh, broad um, and major criteria that are used in place prioritization uh, exercises, or I shouldn't say exercises, but place prioritization analysis. Uh, first one, complementarity, irreplaceability, and then the third one, vulnerability. And um, I'm going to explain them, them briefly in the next slide. Okay, so complementarity refers to new areas that contribute something new, add something new to the existing network of protected areas. So um, if you think about um, maybe the conservation goal is to um, ensure protection of all uh, endemic plants in a region. I know there are a lot of plant scientists, so we need to, <laughs> we need to keep uh, talking about plants uh, or uh, introduce plants more often than, than we've done maybe um, the past few days. So we w the, the goal is uh, protect, provide some protection, uh, a level of protection to all uh, plant species in an endemic uh, region. The existing network of protected areas uh, maybe um, uh, covers let's say 75% of the, uh, the, the known flora in that, in that region. So we have about 25% remaining, 25% uh, of species, which we need to, uh, to find a way to conserve. And that's where complementarity comes into place, because we want to add uh, areas that have, those, uh, have uh, representatives of those 25% of the species that are not represented in the initial uh, network of protected areas. So Contributing, contributing new information, new, I shouldn't say new information, but new biotic diversity or whatever feature it is that we are trying to, uh, to conserve. Then irreplaceability has to do with how crucial a particular area is to the conservation process. So if we have multiple um, uh, areas that meet the same conservation goal we have, that means they are not irreplaceable. But if we have a single one that meets the criterion we have, adding that 25% missing, that missing 25% of, of plant diversity, we have just one area that does that and no other areas, that is an irreplaceable area and that becomes a highly important uh, critical area to include in our prioritization plan. And then finally, vulnerability. Uh, is a form of irreplaceability that takes into account time. So over time, uh, if, um, if an area is uh, prone to biodiversity loss, that is an irreplaceable area because uh, in a certain amount of time, um, we will lose the, uh, the diversity that we have in that particular area. So even though now at this point they are not um, threatened, uh, maybe in the future they are, and uh, because of, let's say, uh, development or, um, I don't know, um, some, some, some uh, uh, pressure, we want that's, that means that area is vulnerable and we want to, uh, as much as possible, include that area in our prioritization uh, analysis as well. Now, a little bit more about uh, irreplaceability. Uh, what kinds of uh, uh, conservation targets uh, qualify or uh, are, are seen as uh, part of this irre irreplaceability criterion. First of all, restric restricted range species. So very clear if we have species that are endemic to a region or restricted to a region, they are not found anywhere else or they are found in very few other areas. This becomes um, uh, um, a good example of uh, irre irreplaceability. We may have species that are not endemic to an area, have a, a wide distribution, but for some reason have a clumped, in part of their, uh, of their entire distribution, they have a clumped uh, or aggregated distribution. So we have a widespread species, but the, uh, a great deal of the uh, number of individuals, a great deal of the population size is clumped in a particular region. 
again, that is a good candidate uh, area for an irreplaceable, for this criterion of irreplaceability. Um, then we have globally significant congregations. Um, this would be um, similar to uh, clumped distribution, but at large scale. So at large scale, we have global, um, we have species that um, at large scale um, are found uh, concentrated in, uh, in um, se uh, several significant uh, regions of, con uh, of congregation or uh, I guess accumulation of individuals. And then the last one, source populations, has to do with, uh, if you are familiar with the um, uh, meta-population theory, so uh, the way uh, populations are, are distributed across a landscape, uh, we have, uh, in the meta-population theory, we talk a lot about source populations, meaning uh, populations from which individuals disperse into uh, other patches of suitable habitat. Without the source populations, the uh, patches of suitable habitat are not uh, periodically um, occupied because there is no source of individuals to, uh, to um, make use of all the uh, habitat patches. So source populations are important, again irreplaceable. If we lose the source population, we lose the, uh, the meaning of the, the means by which this uh, particular species is uh, uh, making use of space. Okay, now to apply this criterion, of uh, irre irreplaceability, uh, we do need to know where species are. We need, we need good information about uh, species distributions. We talked quite, quite some time, uh, we spent quite some time talking about how uh, conservation biology is a crisis discipline, or at least it was a crisis di discipline um, 30, 20 years ago, we now have more, uh, we have access to more data, so we are not considering conservation biology necessarily a crisis discipline. It, we still have uh, urgent uh, uh, matters to take care of, but we do have uh, more data available than we did 30 years ago. So we do have knowledge about species, uh, uh, some species distributions, but uh, in uh, many situations we actually uh, uh, don't, especially in the high um, uh, biodiversity, high um, diversity, um, high re regions of high diversity. I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. Okay, so if we don't have uh, knowledge, good knowledge about the, the distribution uh, range of a species or multiple species, in, in general when we, when we do place prioritization, we take into account the distribution of, of many species, not just one. So um, we, we find ourselves a lot in the situation of not enough data. What we can do is extrapolate for the limited uh, information we have available. So we have a set of museum records, we have a set of uh, maybe uh, um, several surveys that were done um, 30 years ago. Uh, we may have um, some a monograph that was published some years ago. So those are sources of information. They are not complete, they are not exhaustive, they are not very uh, indicative of, uh, or they, are not, they don't represent a good description of the species distribution, but it's a start. So what we can do with, uh, with this uh, limited available information is extrapolate to get to that potential distribution of, uh, of the species. So what we how we do this is we use um, known presences and environmental data associated with those known presences, and we create, uh, we generate um, estimates of uh, ecological niches for those species, and that in turn gives us potential distributions uh, for those species. So then, then we have we have an estimation of uh, species distributions with uh, stemming from or starting with uh, limited information. Now, uh, I put here the, the link to the uh, ecological niche modeling uh, um, course that was part of the biodiversity informatics training curriculum. Um, and um, it is the entire course, a week or 10 days, uh, I don't remember, a week uh, of information. So if you want to start somewhere with, uh, if you're interested in ecological niche modeling, um, highly uh, recommended to start with a course that is all uh, uh, videotaped and all the information is available online, all the uh, lectures. Okay, so that's, that's how we get at making, making use of limited uh, information and extrapolating from inf uh, limited information. Now, 
we have some information, some ideas now about uh, criteria that we should uh, be using when, um, when uh, undergoing these place prioritization uh, analyses and ways to address lack or limited uh, data availability. Um, the next question is, who should be doing this? Who should be um, generating these place prioritization um, analysis? And it, there is no uh, one answer. <laughs> this is the, uh, the motto of, of our course. But uh, it depends on the scale of the prioritization. Now, if um, IUCN or uh, Conservation International um, creates a, a map of biodiversity hotspots, and that is a prioritization uh, um, analysis, uh, the local stakeholders at that global scale are not, are not uh, interviewed or are not included in the process because it is a, a global coarse scale analysis. But if we are interested in creating a network of protected areas uh, or reserves in, let's say, uh, southwestern Ethiopia to uh, provide better, um, I don't know, protection for lions, big carnivores, migration between uh, na uh, established national parks, we definitely need to include all these, uh, all these stakeholders. So obviously the government needs to be included. Um, academic, uh, the academic uh, sector should be included to provide uh, um, analysis for the prioritization. NGOs um, provide support and financial support a lot of times. And then we, uh, as we repeated uh, uh, um, quite a lot um, so far uh, in these three days, we need to include the local uh, stakeholders, local communities, um, give them a, um, a seat at the table and listen to their, to their concerns and their uh, advice about uh, uh, prioritizing in a, in a region. Any questions? No?